A reading from 2 Kings, chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, and verses 14 to 19. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says, Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say, and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came from Babylon. The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood that will be born to you, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My friends, good morning. I shall unmask myself first, huh? then we can. It's a joy for me to be here, uh, now that our pastors are away. That's what retired pastors are for. Uh. They're like spare tires, you know? They come in and do things, huh? and uh, to bring God's word as necessary. Come, let us pray together. Father, it is our joy as the Lord's people to gather unto the Lord, to gather unto your word, and in the day of the Lord to worship you this day, the Lord's day. Now, will you grant us the grace of the power of the work of the spirits to bind the works of the enemy over any of us so that our hearts will be warmed by you, that our mind will be renewed by you, and that our spirits will be filled with you to our satisfaction because we met with you. Now, Lord, notwithstanding the weakness of your servant in proclaiming your word, please do the work that you do, Lord Holy Spirit, in unveiling the truths that changes our lives, truth that will make us be satisfied and glorifying to you. Please hear this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, let me first say, today you get a break of filling in blanks. Lah. No need to fill blanks. Huh? So they're all there. Two, I want to invite you to listen with your heart, not so much your mind, trying to grapple with information. That's needful. Because without the transformation of our minds, the rationality of what we hear, we cannot respond in a manner that we choose and make our choices. But sometimes, all the rational input is useless because the effects, the affection, the emotion of the will 
is not moved, and therefore there is no transformation. There's a lot of information, but no transformation. So today, notwithstanding whether the PowerPoint keep up with me or not, you don't worry. It's all contained within your notes. Huh? Just pay attention with your hearts to what the Lord has to say to us. In recent times, one of the deaths that many of us cannot forget is the death of Queen Elizabeth II, 96 years old. The others who, who is comparable, as I remember it in 2013 in December, was the death of Nelson Mandela. The impact of their deaths is such that it calls forth from a global level, almost borderless, people who acknowledge with grief what they have lost in a person that ruled for 70 years in Queen Elizabeth's case. Now, it's easy. We know we've got a politician here who is 95 or so, remembered for wrong things also can. Uh, but this particular sister, she's a Christian. She's the head of the Church of England globally, something like the Pope, as it were. And her life was lived in such a way that President Joe Biden, on the 18th of September, when he was in Lancaster House, among all the dignitaries in the world, was panning his condolences and appreciation, was asked to say a few words and was caught televised, his words. And he said something to this effect. He said that to him, that to the people of the, of the United Kingdom, people who are, that you are fortunate that you have had her for 70 years, we all were. Then he went on to say this. People who stand out in your mind are those who are the same person, and uh, same in person and image. People who stand out in your mind are the same in person and image. This may be a great king, of the, a great queen of the Commonwealth, but Joe Biden knows firsthand, as with many others who testified, who willingly made their way to England to pay their last respects from different corners of the world. That gravitational pull does not need to be paid. It is won. Won by a life in the words of Theresa May, the ex-Prime Minister. She said, our queen, in her tribute that she paid, shines out in three particular areas. One, she's a person with a deep sense of duty person who goes to do whatever she needs to do, rain, sunshine, whatever else is happening. And I'm very glad that there are many here. I was here, pastor, about 20 years ago. I see some of us have been transformed in our look, but still very much in faith, in loyalty of service to the church. She is all about devotion and serving, she said. And that Theresa May went on to say she's deep in the way that she continues to be a promise keeper. She keeps her vows uh, in which she has made, along with this devotion of service. Then she said, Queen Elizabeth II is a person of deep decency, a person who knows what is to be civil, to be gracious, to say thank you, to say sorry, a person who makes you feel that you are important and that your dignity is intact with her when she meets you, notwithstanding your social status. A person of deep decency. What you see is what you get. You know, not only when you know, this pastor dons his uniform on Sunday, like me, when he takes them off, he's the same person. That's the key thing. You're the same person when you come to church and when you leave this church. But people outside can say, yeah, what you see is what you get. And so, this queen, you know, her greatness in the way that now that she has passed came about because one of the key things that she did when her father passed away, King George VI, passed away, and she was 25 years old, 10 months into Christmas, on that day before the coronation, in the following year, 
1956. And then just before that, in 1952, in her, her particular, uh, before the year after 1953, she was crowned. In the Christmas broadcast to the whole of the Commonwealth nations, she said this, I want to ask you all, whatever your religion may be, to pray for me on that day, the day when she will be on the 2nd of June, 1953, will be crowned. To pray that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve Him and you all the days of my life. She asked for wisdom. She asked for strength. No wonder she lived to be 96 years old. She asked that all these may be wound together so that she may discharge her role and responsibility faithfully, first unto God and then to others. Now, my friends, that is a mirror prayer that we see in, second, in 1 Kings chapter 3. You remember the other king who lived in 950 BC, the, the, the kind of era, who asked for when he was 20 years old. Queen Elizabeth was 25 years old when she, when she ascended the throne. When you are when you are governing a whole lot of people around you at close quarters and you are 20 years old, you feel totally inadequate, won't you? Inexperienced. When there are multi-factions, like today when we go to our election, there will be multi-alliances. We need God's wisdom to be able to cast our votes for the right alliance. When there are multi-factionalism politically, Things are difficult to manage. You are 20 years old. There are people who are three times your age who have been in the administration of the palace more than you. When you are 20 years old, you haven't tested your skills. You haven't tasted what it is to manage people properly. And so, King Solomon, when the Lord appeared to him, we are told in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. God gave him, God gave him an open asking. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him, kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, this is where the crux begins. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people. They number at least two million at that point of time, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servants, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people. Some, some version says wisdom to govern your people. That I may discern between good and evil. You see, wisdom is not mere knowledge. Wisdom has, to, has the ability to choose what is right from wrong, what is truth from lies. Wisdom has that. To govern your people that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern these great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Then it is the Lord's turn to answer him in verse 10 of 1 Kings chapter 3. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for, your long, for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, 
I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none that you shall that shall uh, like you shall arise after you. Then, this is the greatness and the bigness, the graciousness, the generosity incalculable, the gratuitousness of God's heart. I give you also what you have not asked. You ask, I give you what you did not ask as well too. Both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Parallel to Queen Elizabeth's prayer, almost, in substance and contents. And we see how that played out for King Solomon. You see, Queen Elizabeth and King Solomon, the common thread at the core of the DNA of their prayer is other centricity. It's not about me. It's about, yeah, it's about me, but me for others. You could say their attitude is this I love God, so I serve others. I love God. It's you. You called me. You loved me into your kingdom. Secondly, it's about mission and service. It's about others. Before that, it is about acknowledging I'm actually only a finite human being with great limitations due to my age, my abilities, my connections. My resources, I acknowledge I'm only a little boy, he puts it that way. And thirdly, to rule your people, I need you to equip me for their sake. My friends, it's no shame. When you want to pray and need to pray, Lord, please give me the, your anointing, give me your gifting, as I've told my intercessors to pray for me today, so that I can be your blessing to my friends and God's people that gather today on the Lord's Day unto the Lord around His Word in K.L. Wesley. No shame. I ask them, please pray for me that God will anoint me. God will give me what I need in order to bless other people. God will give us things beyond our expectation. Now, my friends, I think many of us have been stonewalled by our own sometimes misplaced humility. We don't ask for things that God's people need, that we need to ask to be of service toward fulfilling that need. Your small group leader, do you ask God, give me a greater heart for these 12 people under my care. Give me greater listening ability that I hear them, I help to pastor them in the way possible. Sometimes our misplaced humility says, wow, people think you are self-aggrandizing, you know. You are self-exalting. Don't let the devil fool you on that one. You ever ask for God's anointing, blessing in your life to be a source of blessing to others more and more? Lord, please make me a good father because my daughter needs a good father. Lord, make me a good bishop so that the people, the 200 over 1,000 Methodists across East and West Malaysia can be blessed in some ways through me. That was my prayer when I was an executive bishop. My friends, this particular saying that stays in my heart for a long time is by this bishop called Phillips Brooks. Now, it's inside your quotation there. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, your strength. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be the miracle. Every day you shall wonder at yourself at the richness of life which has come to you by the grace of God. In other words, I fit into your sovereign plans, no matter how big they are beyond my contemplation and grasping, Almighty God, 
and I do not fit you into my strength. I, Lord, I fit into your sovereign plans and purposes, whatever your, that, no matter how, how gigantic that might be, but, and I do not fit you into the limitations of my strengths and abilities. That's Philip Brooks' prayer for us. We have this king that the life of a 96-year-old queen ignite for us to remember to be other-centric in our prayers. About 250 years on or more, we come to visit another king. The king that was read to us, that is described in Second in uh, Second Kings twenty, that we we looked at together. Now, my friends, this king Hezekiah. Before you jump into the wrong conclusion about him, let me put it this way: at this point of his life, he was thirty-nine years old. God, in this story that we heard just now, this narrative that is historical. There is a King Hezekiah. He lived another 15 years so that he passed on at the age of 54. In a world and at a time in terms of the medical level that they have, that's a pretty long life. That's why John Wesley, who shot above 80 years old, is in a way a oddball of long life in England at that point of time. It's, it's a testament about the way he looked after himself and God's hand upon John Wesley. You don't live that long in those uh, century before the Industrial Revolution especially. This particular king, he had a great record actually up to up that point when he was 39 years old. He was zealous for the Lord. He revived the, after his father which was Ahaz, an apostate father who worshipped other gods. He cleansed the temple he instituted the Passover, calling it a holy day yet again and a holiday. He brought about the worship of God back into the temple. He ignited a revival in the life and for the good welfare of Judah. He restored temple worship as it should be. Then it came to this point when he had to struggle with the crisis of sickness which in turn churns up for him the need to confront uncertainty Live or die, not sure, you know. And the uncertainty about what is at the backdrop of it all, that is the elephant in the room, am I going to live or die? Mortality. The struggle with mortality. The struggle with mortality becomes emotionally real when you're on the brink of dying. When you are not on the edge of dying and you're some distance away, the struggle with mortality is mostly on, in the mind, mental level, rationally. But when you are on the precipice of the age of dying, when this boil won't go away, they say it's some kind of cancer probably, or even some kind of plague, it just grew bigger and bigger. And the more it grows bigger, the, you are inching your way to the age of death. And it came upon him, that's why he wept. Weeping is an emotional word, is it not? He wept bitterly. The confrontation with death suddenly became so real because God sent his servant, the prophet Isaiah, who was a close ally of this king who guided him, a godly prophet, and said, King Hezekiah, your highness, you have to wrap up things in your household now you have to set your house in order. Put your house in order because you will not survive this illness. And the response from King Hezekiah was twofold. One, emotionally he grasped the matter. He wept bitterly. No shame, my friends. I may be standing quite well now and seem to be a bit far away from the precipice of mortality, but it will come. Some of us are nearer because of chronology of our lives and some illnesses that we carry. 
but everyone has to face off with that. He wept bitterly, meaning he embraced, even though he didn't accept that he was going to die, emotionally, not only rationally. Secondly, his response was, it triggered off a bargaining process with God. He said, God, I've served you wholeheartedly, you know. Don't I merit some consideration of a change of mind on your part in terms of this particular pronouncement of my mortality that is forthcoming soon? So he used whatever collateral he had in terms of his journey as a king's servant, the king of kings' servant. You see, that's all right. Obviously, what he dug out, the merits on what he stood, God did not contest. That's why God answered his prayer. He lived a godly life. But the only problem is, at that root of asking is an essential issue. Without saying so much, it is like challenging God and God and his wisdom. God who knows from beginning to end your life. God who knew the Garden of Eden to the day when revelations will say, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, please come again. God's wisdom, God's calculation, God's omniscience. God cannot be wrong. That's what omniscience actually mean. There are three omni. One omni omnipotent, some people pronounce omnipotent. Omnipotent means all-powerful. Nothing is outside the power of God to do. The second is omnipresent. God is everywhere as we worship Him. You cannot exclude Him, though you may not see Him. The third is omniscience. Omniscience means God knows everything. He cannot be wrong. You and I may study for exams and get our facts wrong, but not God. And God told him, the time has come, my servant, for you to go home, to come home, to be with me. He contested that fact. He said, I like to live on longer. God in his great mercy, we live in an open universe versus a closed one. What does that mean? An open universe is this, that it is not like, you know, this gigantic super, super computer locked in with their algorithms and their super knowledge. They, they predict certain things, they plan certain things. You become caught in a preset, deterministic way. You have no room to move. It's not like that where God is concerned. It's not about automaton. It's not about being robotic in our life. It's not about being closed in so that everything is cast in stone. No point for me to pray and talk to God and relate to Him. It's not like that. It is an open universe. An open universe, if I put it in a metaphorical way, is like a football team, a soccer team. Who can go in to the field, go onto the field on the pitch, play against the enemy 11 other players, make wrong passes along the way. Sometimes even Lionel Messi does that. Cannot, you, the opposite things can happen. And of course, winning is a great thing. In that 90 minutes, there is this interactiveness of openness. You can pass, you can you know, attack from the left side, or you can attack from the left side, or the right side. There is an openness to the play. But, let me put it this way, that in God's soccer team, at the end of the day, God's team will win. But it doesn't mean you are like God, God is using his you know, super control council, no? in somewhere he's you know, moving your leg here and there and then playing the play, the play like that? No. We have freedom. We can play. And therefore, Paul says in an open universe, we are co-workers with God. We pray that the GE15 will be different. We cannot say it's going to happen, it happened, monsoon or not, it just happens. Do you know who is going to be the nominated uh, person to stand for the parliamentary seats where you are at? Do you know who your Adun assembly person is? 
Do you at least pray for them you know, in, in some course of the day? We may give away a penalty. Oh, you know, got penalty against us. But the game is not over yet until God says so. In our world, it is an open universe. God can come in as He wishes. We can relate to Him. We have power of votes. God has veto power, finally. Let me, let me describe it this way. But it doesn't mean because God got veto power, I don't do anything, you know. You got your votes that you need to cast, whether you like it or not. We live in an open universe. So, when King Hezekiah decided to counter God, but I think, uh, I still want to live on, no, got family members, they never said this, lah, but I can imagine. Huh? I got so many other dreams I haven't fulfilled, you know. I got so many unfinished tasks to attend to. So many ambitions that I still have. He questioned and refused to relinquish control to God's uncontestable wisdom and sovereignty. Let me quickly add, it is not wrong to ask God for things you can. But remember this, in a while, the last prayer we will look at. So the contrast Pre-15 years to post-15 years, what happened? Pre-15 years, before God answered him when he was age 39, he was known as a godly king, unspoiled record. He saw in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, 185,000 enemy troops belonging to the superpower of that time, the Assyrians. God's angel slew them because he prayed. He saw the connection between a great prophet like Isaiah and his life. He gained great reputation, wealth. He was famous, praised and honored. In fact, Hezekiah and King Josiah are the prominent Judean kings to stand out in a history, historical memory of what is a good king. When he contested that, that God do not take me home yet, what happened after that? The second part of that reading shows us. Pride gave in to what is, would have been wise for him to do. The Babylonian Empire was the, super, was the junior superpower at that point of time. When the king of, the, of Babylon sent his son, the prince, to visit you, to congratulate you, albeit there is that the Babylonians worshipped the sun and they found that this sign and wonder that God used appropriately a time machine, the sundial, to demonstrate to him the extension of the time of his life. Very appropriate uh, kind of symbolism. And for the dial not to go forward, which is natural, like our clock goes clockwise, but to go anti-clockwise 10 degrees. He saw this wonder at this point of time that God promised him 15 years, I will give to you. These 15 years, what happened was, he, his pride took full maturation. When this bunch of people who have hidden motives, they were political, they want to conscript him, or at least persuade him to side with Babylon against Assyria. Who better than to persuade than the one who has seen 185,000 of the enemy th troops slain by the Lord. What did he do? His pride made him show off everything that he had. Verse 13 and 15. Not a single thing did I not show them. That's how, that's how complete his pride took him to become a person who is boastful. And this is what I have, the goal, my buildings. Secondly, pride shares the same fence as ingratitude. They are neighbors. Eh? 
instead of acknowledging all this uh, is God's manifestation of His blessing in my life, He took all the credit upon Himself. Uh. All this uh, in my lifetime, I'm self-made man. Uh. All this I did. Then He began to show off His gifts and His carnal confidence. You know, He, he could have said, Oh, by the way, uh, this uh, esteemed Babylonian entourage, prince, can I take you to see our God's temple or not? Did he do that? No. If he had done that, it would have been a wonderful opportunity to point them to who Yahweh is. He didn't do that. Worse, third year into his 15 years extension, his son Manasseh, was born. Who is Manasseh? Manasseh, this king is the worst, he's the scum of the earth. He even offered his own sons to foreign gods. He committed moral sins that are indescribable. And how long did he rule? He ruled 50, 55 years. When he contested God's wisdom, he reaped the whirlwind of his own life. Not only him, but his people suffered because of his, his self-centric choice. And down the road, your children will become eunuchs to the Babylonians. Who are these children among them? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. was his contestation for extension wise? Could he see 15 years down the road what could have happened except God? Be careful what you ask for. Now my friends, we flip the pages, then we visit two other characters. Moses. You know, Moses, if anybody deserves to go into the promised land, on the last year of the 40 year, 40 year, on the last year of the 40 years in the wilderness, in Numbers chapter 20, three important people were going to die. Two died before him. His sister Miriam, his brother Aaron, then his turn. You see, once it comes to the 41st year, they'll be inside the promised land. But he wasn't going to set foot in the promised land. Only two of the generation that he belonged to, more or less, would set foot there. Joshua and Caleb. His name wasn't included. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 34, God told him, you go up Mount Nebo. I'll, give you a, I'll let you have a look at the promised land, but you won't move an inch across the border. Now, if you were Moses, what would you say to God? You know, you could have easily said, oh hey God, first 40 years of my life in Pharaoh's house, are you for me? Next 40 years in the wilderness, I met my Jethro, my father-in-law, you taught me how to be a shepherd. The last 40 years, uh, you made me whoa, whoa, sweat, toil, and tears, and blood flowing, uh, leading this, this ungrateful people. Now you tell me I cannot get in. Uh. We are just down there on in. If anybody has got the right, I think is the right way of putting it, uh, or the grounds, or a sound basis to ask God for a change of mind, I think we can, we can empathize with Moses. But did he do that? He didn't. He accepted the fact that time is up. God's wisdom meant that my time is up. Time for me to move on. No need to look back. Don't worry about who is coming after me. Don't worry about Joshua. Don't worry about Caleb. God will deal with them in the unfinished business that is finished for me at this point of time. And so, he relinquished. His attitude was, Lord, be it so. And he died and was buried in an unmarked grave. 
The scripture was very clear about that, that nobody knew where he was buried. I mean, there are good reasons. That's, that's grounds for another sermon. Uh. But this one, he was unmarked. A famous man buried in an unmarked grave. And he was happy to accept that. Because at the heart of Moses' heart is faith. If God says so, his omniscience, his omnipresence, so be it. There are, there's another ground that I won't go into. It's a punishment for his disobedience in the, in the desert of Zin. And so, God honoured him in Matthew 17, verse 2, that at the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember, two Old Testament giant, giants appeared, Elijah, the prophets, and Moses, the lawmaker, and Peter and his gang, they were thrown off their feet. God honoured Moses so that he is mentioned again in the New Testament, right smack in the Gospels. You never lose out when you hear God's timing and what God says to you. Be careful what you ask for. And finally, the prayer of relinquishment, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not my will, but yours be done. In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When we choose relinquishment, meaning, Lord, I surrender wholeheartedly to you. I give it to you. Your will and my cross, but I choose to withdraw my will and let your will, even though you cannot remove the cup from me, I surrender to that will. Let it come to pass. Notwithstanding what my mind says, what my heart fears, what my flesh is in trembling about because of the pain and the shame that is coming. But you are all wise. You are omniscient. You are the author and script writer of all existence, including my life. I surrender to you. The Lord Jesus came. Prayer of relinquishment. Giving in to the Father's will. In a while, I'm going to ask you, you have come here personally to honour God, to worship. God has personally noted you. And God is personally speaking to you, if you are listening and want to listen. I want to ask you whether if you are willing and wanting, regardless of the circumstances of your life, be it medical, be it circumstances to do with people you love, that you, that's breaking your heart. Be it about your work. Be it about your age. Be it about your family, your marriage, and other things. I want to pray this prayer, and those of you who are meeting God personally here, being met by Him personally and being honoured, if you will, I want to invite you without shame to stand with me to make this prayer but not now, in a while. But I'll let you know what the prayer is first. O oh Lord, today I yield myself to you, especially along with the burdens and heavy loads that I am carrying. I choose to trust in your will and your wisdom at this moment. May your way have perfect sway in my life. I choose to surrender to you my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions, my unfinished businesses. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. I place them into your loving care, my family, my friends, my future, my personal circumstances. Care for them with a care that I can never give. 
and I choose to release them into your sovereign hands. And my need, I surrender to you, the need to control, the craving of status, and other things. Afterwards, when I tell you to and invite you to, and you want to present yourself with whatever you are carrying, so that you can say, I pray the prayer relinquishment after this spirit, then you just stand. Don't worry about other people. You have come like I have come today, the Lord's day, to worship Him. I, like you, mean personal business, although I love being with you all in giving my offering in worshiping Him. God sees you and me. He sees Ong Wai Tik today serving Him. Although he didn't have to, he can turn down the invitation. But he honors me by giving me this privilege. I want you to feel that way because you are here on that basis, even though you are surrounded by a crowd of people. And your personal response, he invites you to. And so, my friends, when we pray the prayer of relinquishment, it is happening every day. In a way, you cannot pray in advance, in a way, although in faith, you can make a resolution. But it must happen every day when the tire hits the road today. Over certain circumstances, I, you are carrying today. Then that is when the voluntary stepping aside to let God step in by myself emptying takes place. Then the prayer of submission or surrender not my will, but yours be done, no matter what I think should happen, no matter how worthy I think the answer should be lined up on my side, but I trust you. It must be a prayer of abandonment. I leave completely, finally to you. And so, in this way, we can see ourselves bringing our illness, bringing the people we love, bringing our circumstances, bringing our spouse. Lord, in my mind, I carry them and put them into your hand, fully surrendering them to you. Have your way. And that is what exactly Horatio Spafford, the one who wrote for us, It is well with my soul. When on the 22nd of November, 1873, his, the, the steamship that carried his wife and four daughters was crossing the Atlantic, had, a, had an accident with an iron sailing vessel, killing 20, 226 people on board on their ship, including his four daughters, Annie, 12, Maggie, 7, Bessie, 4, and an 18-year-old baby daughter, only the wife survived. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows roll like the sea billows, whatever my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford, prayer of relinquishment, and he pens that. And then his penning goes on to say that the day will come when faith shall become like sight. What I don't understand now, what I misunderstood now, what I misconstrue now, what is in my ignorance I cannot square. One day, my faith shall become sight. All will be explained. Because God, is a great, good, gracious, sovereign God. Let us pray. Father, thank you that this day we can gather unto you. Thank you that you receive us. Sometimes our presentation of our own attendance before you is a mixture of habits, custom, but also our personal belief in you. Hence, you know us personally. 
You receive us personally, even though we are in a congregation and an assembly of your people. Today, Lord, I believe you gave me this word to share with, my, with your people here, including me. And now, as they choose to make a response of relinquishment of all that they hold that they need to give to you and their lives that need to be relinquished to you, please honour us, honour them. My friends, any of you who want to pray to the Lord today and say, I relinquish, I surrender, I give all unto you, whatever is in my heart I'm carrying now, whatever fear, concern, I invite you to stand. If you can, stand. If you cannot stand, just raise your hands. Make it personal. Make it your personal response to God. If you cannot stand, it's okay. Just raise your hands. Relinquish. Lord, I'm here to relinquish into your hands all that your will be done, the things that I carry. One last time. Anyone else? If you have something in your heart, if you have something, a burden, your life, that you need to give to God and say, yours is the best pair of hands I can ever entrust anything to. You know everything. And I choose to entrust, unlike Hezekiah, what I have in my heart. Father, Thank you for keeping to your word that if we are not ashamed of you, you certainly are not ashamed of us. And so this prayer I make together with my beloved brothers and sisters, your people together. O oh Lord, I yield myself to you, especially along with the burdens and heavy loads that I'm carrying. I choose to trust in your will and your wisdom and your goodness at this moment. May your way have perfect sway in me. I choose to surrender to you all my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions, my difficulties, my unfinished tasks, my unfinished life, my circumstances. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. I place into your loving care my circumstances personal to me, my family, my friends, my future. Thank you, God, that you care for them, all these things, with a care that I can never give nor ever control completely. And so I choose this day to release into your hands all these my needs and my life for you to control and strive to surrender control to you. Hear this prayer and all that is inscribed in the heart of each one of those who are standing before you, including me, and hear us that you may be glorified. Thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen.